program director, uh, our premier, our provincial leadership for the ANC, Women's League and Youth League, the leadership of the university, our regional chair of the ANC who's here and all the leadership, <coughs> Young Women's Desk, SACP, students, comrades, friends, that's a number, I think. Yeah. Comrades, we are meeting here on the month of April. April is a very significant month in the calendar of South Africa. And why? Yes. <laughs> It was in April that our colonizers, the first three ship that brought the colonizers onto our shores came. The Dromodaras, the Reichen, and the Hude Warp. Those were the first three and many others followed. And so April is a month where our problems, when our problems started more than 300 years ago. But at the same time, April is also a month where we saw young people standing against those colonizers. We were just singing today about Solomon Matang. Solomon Matang resisted fought for our freedom, and the colonizers couldn't stand him. They killed him. But when he was walking to his death, to the gallows, he wasn't crying. He didn't have his head bowed down. He had his head up. And he said, his blood will water the tree that will bear the fruit of freedom. And indeed, that's what we are about today. And he was a young man, and many other young men went through that. They went to prison, they were killed, others were killed outside in exile, others were taken to Robin Island, because the young people understood that freedom was important. And so we must understand that even today. But of course, it was also in April that the first <coughs> democratic election took place, where people who were old in their 100 years, 90 years, 80 years, <coughs> were voting for the first time in this country because they were black. <coughs> and that did not happen through a miracle. It did not happen through luck. It was not manna from heaven. It was people's blood. It was people's sacrifices. It was people's struggle. And that's why. But what did we fight for? Yes, the vote, democracy, was one of the things. But we also fought to change the material conditions of our people. We fought for a better life for our people. And that struggle still continues. That's why the ANC says we are still involved in the national democratic revolution. The revolution is not over. So if the revolution is not over, it means we need people to participate in the revolution young people like you. And part of participating in that revolution is studying, mm -hmm. getting skills. So today, it's seven days before we get, almost seven days before we get to our election, where the ANC is going to be. And of course, the ANC is going to win because our people understand.
understand. People, our people understand that the colonization, the oppression, the exploitation took more than 300 years. And it cannot be eradicated completely in 25 years. Never. Our people understand that. But our people also understand that life in 94 is very different from life today. And you are testimony to that sitting here. Before 94, you couldn't come and study here. You couldn't come and study here. <coughs> it was the struggles of those young people, of the ANC, of the women, of many other people, who some gave their lives so that you could be free and come and study here and fight for the removal of the stage. <laughs> some problems, I'll, I'll touch on them. I've had, since I arrived here, because when I arrived, I did some research. I found that there are about 500 students who are facing the issues of deregistration. What I then did, I called the Minister of Education and informed her that I'm faced with this situation here. And she didn't know about it. So she said to me, she's going to get in touch with the vice rector and see what can be done. I will also follow up with her and see whether, and I trust that she will fold, but I'll follow up and find out what has been the discussion. I also know that there are issues around food security. It's a serious issue. We'll have to see how it's there to be. But it's not only an issue here, it seems to be an issue around many campuses. But here, I also have found that there is an issue around housing, security, rezoning. But the good news is that the municipality has now passed the bylaws that will regulate student accommodation. So that it's in line. So that it's in line with the standards that have been set by the Ministry of Education the Department of Education. So that has been, the bylaws have been passed, now they have to be implemented. And also, the housing tribunal has been established. And we are going to continue talking, the province, the region, the municipality, with the police to make sure that there is safety for you because I understand that's an issue as well. But having said that, today we are here about one of the fundamental, the fundamental pillars of freedom, which is about voting, electing a government. And of course, with the ANC, before we go to vote, there are processes that take place, informed by our own principles, by our history, because if you are a revolutionary, you can't be a historic. You must have a sense of history. Informed. <laughs> informed by the Freedom Charter, informed by many other processes. But before we sit and pen the manifesto, there are consultations that take place across, across many sectors. 
the workers are consulted, the alliance is, as a whole is consulted, young people participate, women participate, civil society participate, because the ANC understands that it is there for the people. So it cannot just decide on its own what should happen in the next five years. But that process goes on until it's taken to the NEC. The NEC looks at it, makes its comments, and indeed the manifesto then gets published. I don't know how many of you have read the ANC manifesto. Are there any who have read it? Yes. Many. So you know what's in it. Okay. But of course, the manifesto has to take into account the realities. And what are the realities that are facing us right now? The three main realities that are facing us, challenges that are facing us, that we must deal with and they are overarching challenges. That's the challenge of poverty, that's the challenge of unemployment, and the challenge of inequality. Now, there are issues in the manifesto that address that. We also still faced with a sexist society. Women still suffer discrimination in many issues at work, in society, sometimes even at school, even the way they are paid, you do the same work with a man and he gets more. But also there is abuse of women. There is violence against women. So that equality that the Constitution talks about has not been achieved, but it's a process. It's a process. We know that you are here as students, but you are not going to be students forever. In a few years' time, you will be workers, you will be entrepreneurs, you will be professionals, you will be all sorts of things. And you will be driving the development of this country. But let me start by, with education, because our manifesto is also informed by our Freedom Charter, which says the doors of learning shall be open. Doors of learning and culture shall be open. And that's why you are here. Because those doors are open. But we know that even when those doors are open, there are still challenges. And that's why the ANC has now a policy and the government of making sure that children who come from poor families and working class families are not denied education because they don't have money. That's a very important milestone because we understand and we believe that education is not just for you to reach your full potential, but education is also an equalizer. If you are skilled, if you are a pilot and you are sitting in the cockpit, it doesn't matter whether you come from a poor family and the other one, your co-pilot comes from a rich family. In that cockpit, you are equal. At the end of the month, you get the same pay. You have the same privileges. And that goes for whether you are an engineer, whether you are going into space, which I hope some of our young people will be going into space. Whether you are going into this, 
maritime highways, it doesn't matter. Education is an equalizer. That's why we want our young people to have skills. But secondly, we want our young people to have skills so that we can drive the development and the economy of this country. Part of the reason the economy is not growing as it should is because of the skills gap. <coughs> Engineers and professionals create jobs. They grow the economy. And if you don't have them, your economy will not grow to the same extent as those who have them. So it's important that we acknowledge that and our manifesto acknowledges that. Because when you have skills, you can get good jobs. But you can also create jobs. Because we don't want to produce only job seekers. We also want to produce job creators. So we must move away from the mentality that all of us must be employed. <coughs> Some of us must be employers. And that's what the ANC is paying so much attention to education. You know that now any learning is going to be compulsory. So your kids, when they start going to school, they will not start at the age of seven. They will start with early childhood development. And because that assists when they actually start schooling. And so that is a very important, so the whole value chain of education is being addressed by this manifesto, by the ANC, from early childhood right up to tertiary. But we also understand that a child cannot grow if they don't have food. First thousand days are very important to the child. That's why the ANC ensures that if a child doesn't have parents who can support it, at least there's some support from government. And of course, the elderly are also supported <coughs> because we respect <coughs> our elderly people who have created wealth and developed this country. When they reach their old age, we must respect them. We must make sure that they have, if they don't have a pension from work, they have a pension, a grant from the government. Of course, there are issues around what you are talking about. We know there are issues around sanitary pets. And we know that it's not enough to just zero rate, but that's a step in the right direction. But we are going to be looking at that to see whether we can't talk and negotiate so that the prices are not so high. Mm. And that's why also the ANC has scrapped experience for entry jobs into government. You are correct as students and as young people. Who is supposed to give you experience when you leave school? Mm -hmm. So when you leave school, you can apply for a job at the entry level. You don't have to produce experience. So that's a step, a big step in the right direction. And that's why the ANC must continue in government. Mm. <laughs> the ANC also understands that we must also develop what our people know best, develop our cultural and our creative industries. 
and make sure that those become jobs. You know, America has Hollywood and it makes billions of dollars. India then looked at Bollywood. It has millions of dollars. Nigeria has Nollywood. <laughs> and some of the people here watch every day what comes out of Nigeria, which is good. But we must also develop our own. We must make sure we develop our own as well. Our manifesto understands that jobs are very important. And so industrialization, manufacturing, beneficiation of our minerals is very important. And it's going to make sure that that happens. And also, in agriculture, we want to ensure that it's not just the agricultural products, but the value chain and the markets for those products. Of course, there are challenges. We know that the economy and jobs are not really, jobs are not created by big companies. Big companies employ fewer people, they use technology, some of them even use <laughs> robots. But jobs are created by small and medium enterprises. And we have to ensure that we scale up the development of small and medium enterprises. That we incubate them, we make sure that they succeed. And then feed into the bigger companies, but also become big companies themselves eventually. But we can also do that through using government procurement. Government procures about 600 billion worth of services. So how can we do that? I use the example of some of the, just one example because we don't have a lot of time. In KZ10, for instance, they've started in five regions and they are rolling it out to other regions where they've decided that school feeding Children must eat healthy. They must eat fresh produce as well. And they've said to farmers and to ordinary people in their gardens, in their fields, that whatever you've grown, whether it's tomato, carrot, cabbage, we will buy, we will collect, and we send to the schools so that our kids can eat. That's how government can use its procurement. Because government procures the, school, the food that's eaten in the schools. So by procuring it from our people, it means it's putting money into the pockets of our people. And it doesn't matter, you don't have to have a truck full of carrots. You can have one bag of carrots and buy it. And then you can go. So, there are lots of ways, uniforms and many other things that government can procure from our people. And it's not only school feeding, it's just the beginning. Government feeds patients in hospitals. Government feeds prisoners in correctional services. So, just using that one example, we can empower people we can grow small and medium enterprises, and some of them can even eventually become big. And of course, we are also consumers. And we must also have solidarity. 
and consume things that come from us and not say, no, I won't buy from this one. Let's have solidarity. Let's buy from other black people. Not saying we shouldn't buy from white people. We buy from white people every day. But if black people have something, let's support them. Let's support them also. The ANC is very mindful of jobs. Because it is through jobs, through education and skills, that we can tackle the issue of poverty and inequality. And Mandela, President Mandela himself, said as long as there is poverty, there is no freedom. So that's why I say the revolution is still ongoing. The struggle continues. Because until, until we deal with inequality, until we deal with poverty, we can't really say the revolution is over. It's not. So our manifesto draws from all those realities. Of course, we must strengthen government. We must have good governance. We must make sure that money that's meant for services goes to services. We must fight corruption both in the public sector and in the private sector. Because corruption corrodes <coughs> the trust between the government and the people. So it's important, it also robs the people of the resources that should be going to services. <coughs> but of course, we don't live in an island, we are not isolated. The trends in the world also influence us. When there is an economic crisis globally, we don't escape it. But what we are also saying is that, as I said earlier, we should stop sending everything wrong outside. Why? for two reasons, there are others, but I'll only mention two. If you sell raw material, you sell it with the jobs, because the jobs are created where that raw material is going to be processed. So it means we are not only exporting raw material, we are also exporting jobs. That's why it's important that we should beneficiate, we should <coughs> manufacture also here. But also, when you sell raw material, you get very little for it. Mm -hmm. And then you have to buy it as a finished product mm -hmm. for a very high price. Yeah. Instead of us doing it here and us getting that high price, yeah. Yeah. instead of paying that high price. So, that's what we want. But of course, for that, we also need the skills. The fourth industrial revolution is upon us. We must make sure that we are also ready for that. We must not be scared of the fourth industrial revolution because there are jobs that robots do. And those tend to be repetitive, boring jobs, low-paying jobs. So we must prepare for other jobs. We must prepare our young people for the other jobs. But we must also unleash the creativity of our people. Because robots don't create, they are created. So we need our people to be creative. Because creativity will, will always be human. It will not be robots that whether robots maybe can be, be build a building but who must think it's the architect, 
that must say how should this, this building be. They can sew this dress, but it's the designer who must create the design. So the creativity is very important. Yeah. Innovation. We must make sure that our young people are good in science, many of them, so that indeed they can be engineers, they can be technician, technology, labs, they can innovate. And our people are very innovative. We just need to ensure that we give them that space to innovate. So these are the things that inform our manifesto. And these are the things that inform what we think and we want to do in the coming years after we have elected the ANC on the 8th of May, which I think you are going to do until. Yeah. But I also want to just touch on voting itself. Some of our young people, not all, and you must influence them. Some of our young people think, ah, voting is not for us. You know, voting is a right that Solomon died for. It's a right that many others died for, but it's also a responsibility. <coughs> Citizens enjoy rights for five years, but they have a major responsibility once in five years to vote. If you don't vote, you are an irresponsible citizen. vote before you, I come to who you should vote for, but you must vote. That's a responsibility, but that's also a right. So it's not just something that you must take lightly. It's something you must take very seriously. Because it shows you are patriotic, but it shows you are responsible. Can you imagine? If on the 8th of May, no single person goes to vote, what will happen in this country? <laughs> you see, yes, uh, Comrade Ramaphosa will still be president, but you will say he has no mandate. Right? You say he has no mandate. So, you have to go and vote. We have to go and vote to give the government a mandate. And so, I know that you are here, you understand that, but I'm stressing it so that you can also influence other young people who may think voting ah, is not important. It is. And it's good to vote early because it's a holiday. I go around and we go around getting people to go and vote. And young people, especially males, they tend to say, I'll go later when the queue is not so long. And in the meantime, what do they do? They drink. And when later comes, when later comes, they say, ah, oh, let's do it if I don't vote. How is it going to win if you don't vote? It's better to just go and vote and then go and enjoy yourself. So, without wasting too much of your time, I also want to say, as part of the economic landscape, we have 3,000 kilometers of 
coast, we have the sea. The sea is a huge economic space that we don't utilize enough. When I was at the AU and we were working on the... <laughs> Strategy. Uh, one person from <coughs> Europe said, Hey, um, you are waking up now to the sea. And said jokingly, but it wasn't a joke. Really. He said, You know, we thought maybe because of slavery, because slaves were taken through the sea. You run away from the sea and you don't want to see. <laughs> but the sea, our sea is being exploited by the same people who took slaves from us. So we must make sure that the sea contributes to our economy, to our development. But we must also study the areas that have to do with Malta, with the blue economy. It's a whole economy. 90% of the things we import or export on this continent go through the maritime highways. But we don't even have flare, we don't even have ships that carry our flags. That whole transport system, we are not involved and we have to be involved. In the sea, inside those ships, there are consumables. Where do they come from? The people who work there, where do they come from? Those ships are insured. Who are the insurers? They are overseas. They are not here. The whole logistics business to take things to the ports and away from the ports we must be involved. Fishing is a big industry, but only a few companies, monopolies, are in the fishing. We are beginning, we have begun to give licenses, but we need to do more. Aquaculture, we need to do more there. Marine biologists, oceanographers, we must train. So, that's an area of development, that's an area of growth that the ANC has started taking, but we are going to do more there. South Africa and Africa generally is a beautiful continent. South Africa is a beautiful country. There used to be an advert during apartheid days which spoke the truth about the country. It said South Africa is a, is a world in one country because you find everything in South Africa. A tourist will find everything that they want. So let's encourage that. Tourism also creates jobs. It's a multiplier. <clears throat> of course, as young people, we must also engage in sports. When is the World Cup going to come to this continent and to this country? So, we only get it in rugby, but most of us watch football, are interested, support football. So, that cup also must eventually come if not to this country, but to this continent. Mm. So, that's what informs our manifesto. <clears throat> of course, there is a huge issue. Uh, before I came here, I was watching TV, and there was some study done, I don't know by what company, saying voters don't want land, 
Voters don't want radical economic transformation. They are not interested. It's not true. Land. Land is not for any color. South Africa belongs to all who live in it. And what is South Africa? It's land. And land is for everything. You can't be in this hall without land. You can't start a business without land. You can't build a school without land. You can't build a sports field without land. You can't take off to the skies without land. There's nothing you can do. There's nothing that doesn't start on land. Even if you end up in the moon, you started here. <laughs> so people pretend as if land is for something special. No, land is for everything. So land cannot be something that's owned only by a few. Everything needs land. But I, I saw on TV them say, no, our, our black voters, they, they, they're not interested in them. They are influencing us. Because we watch TV passively. Before I sit down, I'll talk about Cuba. Cuba is a very interesting country. Small. It's poor, <coughs> it's blockaded, but do you know in Cuba, 60% of the population has a junior degree, 60%. In Cuba, everybody understands that education is very important, before I say that. And whether you are poor or rich or whatever, they know that education is very important. And I once visited Cuba, and there was a very interesting program. That program was on their TVs, and it was what it was teaching people, kids, how to watch television. And I asked them, "What is this?" teaching people how to watch television. They said yes, because now we're going to have satellite TV, which is going to bring anything and everything. Now we must teach them, because if you watch TV passively, it influences you. If you watch it critically, it, it doesn't influence you. So they were teaching them to watch TV critically and not just to imbibe everything that comes out of there without interrogating it. So they rely on us watching TV passively and they tell us things that are not true. But they repeat them often enough until we think they are true. So, but you, being our budding intellectuals, I'm sure you interrogate whatever you see. It's very important. It's very important. So, I just want to wish all of us. And I also want to thank the two people there that I read my race. They are showing a good example because they have not disturbed us. They have not done anything wrong. They are listening. <laughs> what they do with that information is up to them. Yeah. But 
That's how we should be. We should not be fighting. We should not be fighting each other. And of course, they have behaved very well. So, welcome. We thank you so much for coming to the University of the Free State to come and address students here. Um, thank you so much. Yeah, welcome. Um, we'd like to ask, um, how, how, how will the ANC address issues of gender inequality? Well, as you know, the ANC, right from the time it was still struggling, was fighting for non-sexism. And if you look at our constitution, it also has the equality clause. And if you look at inequality of, of a sexist nature, it's in the government, in the ANC, we are trying to address. That's why in our constitution, even just starting with the ANC constitution, we say every structure in the ANC must have 50% of women. But we also understand that it's not just organizations and structures it's about life of women at work we are campaigning that women must earn the same amount at work for the same work because some companies pay men more than women even if they do the same work which is wrong of course it's not unique to South Africa in government everyone gets the same pay for the same work there is no discrimination but in industry we still find it iceland is the first country in the world to now have a law that it is a criminal offense to pay women less for the same job so we are very much involved the women's league the government itself in making sure that even in education you can see now than ever before that young women are in tertiary institutions and it's not by chance it's because the ANC is working consistently for that even at schools we are making sure that that happens but what is more important is the change of attitude so we are beginning to also work with men because it doesn't help to just work with women. It's important to work with men so that they are confident, they have their self-esteem and they fear no one and they make sure that they are equal. But we must also talk to men so that men understand what equality means. So that men understand that to be a man is not to dominate a woman, it's not to abuse a woman, but it's a partnership. 
And it's been 25 years since uh, the ANC has been in power. Um, what are the differences in its manifesto this time around? Well, this time around, uh, for instance, we just started having free education for people who are poor and working class. That has not been there before. And it's a, a very big step. And of course, we are also looking at the manifesto in terms of decentralizing the areas of economic activity. We're talking about township economy, we're talking about rural economy, which was not necessarily there previously. And we are emphasizing industrialization and beneficiation. So there are lots of things and we are ensuring that in our manifesto, uh, we make sure that issues around land, which everybody needs, are there and are going to be implemented. You know that uh, it's the ANC in the past 10 years that has made sure that people who have HIV live longer because they have treatment. But you are now also emphasizing prevention because it doesn't help to always say we will treat those who have HIV. We must also make sure that there is prevention. And we are also saying that um, children must not only start school at seven years, but they must be compulsory two years of early childhood development, which is new. It wasn't there before. So there are many things that I knew. Uh, these are just a few examples. And I hear you, ma'am, uh, speaking about free education. I mean, there are students here who were listening to your speech, and most of them still don't believe that free education is possible. How would you uh, um, answer students who still think that free education is uh, um, not possible because people are being deregistered from the university and so forth? How would you answer to that? Well, I think let's be fair. The people who are being deregistered are not people who started last year or this year. Because it's people who started before the policy was in place and who were not also funded by NESFAS, who had funding from elsewhere. And for whatever reason, that funding has dried up. So it's not like, how many students do you have in this university? And those who are being deregistered are 500. And as I said, I called the Minister of Education and said something must be done about it. So next year, it will be the third year. And then eventually we won't have students like that in the university. And um, um, to wrap up quickly, um, after 25 years, would you consider the ANC, ANC still a liberation movement? Yes, I do. And I'll tell you why, because it will stop being a liberation movement when you are liberated from poverty, from unemployment, and from inequality. As long as those persist, it means we are still struggling, we are still fighting to eradicate poverty, unemployment, and inequality. So it has to be. To wrap up the session, ma'am, uh, could you please uh, tell us how you would encourage more students to vote as we're heading up to uh, the elections in seven days? It's very important for everyone in this country who's over 18 to vote. Because voting, especially in this country, is a right that some people lost their lives for. Blood was spilled. People were killed. People went to prison so that we could vote. So it's a right that was, is, was earned through the blood of our people. But it's also a responsibility that we must exercise. If we don't exercise that responsibility, it means those like Solomon Matlangu, like Chris Sani, like many others, died in vain because we don't exercise the responsibility of citizens and that's one of the most important responsibilities of a citizen is to vote and elect 
a government that must run the country in the next five years. Well, thank you so much, ma'am, uh, for having us.